coffee consumers and crime connoisseurs, welcome to the 14th episode of Mugshot Mornings, where we explore true crime one sip at a time. As always, I am your host, Sydney, and today we will be discussing the story of the disappearance and reappearance of a man who was potentially captured by something. Stephen Kubaki's story is one of the most intriguing and mysterious disappearances in history. In February 1978, Stephen Kubaki, a 23-year-old student at Hope College in Michigan, vanished while on a solo cross-country skiing trip near the shore of Lake Michigan. His tracks led to the edge of the lake, but there were no signs of what happened next. Kubaki's skis, backpack, and poles were found abandoned, but he was nowhere to be seen. However, 14 months later, Kubaki reappeared in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, over 700 miles where he had first disappeared, and he had no memory of the intervening time. His sudden reappearance and the complete amnesia regarding his whereabouts during those 14 months have left both investigators and the public baffled, making his case one of the most famous unexplained and unsolved mysteries. I gotta, I gotta be real today, guys. It is 6.07 p.m., and I am not in, like... The most upbeat mood. I gotta be real. I'm kind of mad at you. Not really. But nobody said anything last week on my sip and solve. So I can't really give an updates on what other theories were. Granted, last week's episode didn't really have the in, the same engagement that I had the previous two videos. Um, my views were pretty low. Um, so I can't really give an update. I'm still going to do sip and solve because I enjoy it and hopefully it'll get some traction. But if I see that it's not working after a few episodes, then we will do something else. So this new, oh, let me tell you what I'm sipping on. Of course, um, I made myself a vanilla pumpkin cold brew, but I added too much almond milk. And I'm really mad about it, but it's fine. It is time to do the segment of Sip and Solve before we get into our story. It is Christmas Eve, 1945, in Fayetteville, West Virginia. The Sauter family, George, Jeannie, and their nine children, are celebrating the holiday. Around midnight, a fire breaks out and quickly consumes the house. George, Jeannie, and four of the children escape, but the remaining five children, Maurice, Martha, Louise, Jeannie, and Betty, are never seen again. Authorities believed they had perished in the fire, but strangely, no remains were ever found in the ashes. This sparked decades of theories. Were the children kidnapped? Did they die in the fire, or did someone take them? The case remains unsolved to this day, and the Sauter family continued searching for answers for the rest of their lives. Many strange details about this case do not add up. Despite the fire raging for hours, there were no bones or remains found in the ashes. Experts have stated that bones should have survived the fire, even at high temperatures. Also before the fire, someone had cut the phone line to the solder home, making it impossible for them to call for help. Lastly, the family's ladder, which George Sauter regularly used, mysteriously disappeared that night, preventing George from climbing up to save the children. Now, this is where you interact and you tell me your theories, okay? What do you think happened to the Sauter children? Which, I know that I don't give, like, a huge amount of details, but do your own research, look up, kind of see the video, or kind of look over the story and kind of give me your theories and maybe there's a sinister explanation or maybe they really did just pass in the fire. So again, you give me your theories and then I read my favorite next week. This is still an unsolved mystery, so it's not like the answers are going to be correct. Everybody will just name their theory as to what happened. So this is kind of an interaction, also homework. For y'all to go and do. Okay, I also don't have any updates. Um, so we're just going to quickly get into the story. It is a short one today. I say short, but you know, it's a shorter one today. And it is going to be easy to listen to. It's just a conspiracy about the disappearance and reappearance of a man. No one passes away or is murdered, thank God. This is a weird one, okay? So, Stephen Kubaki was born in 1954 in Massachusetts. 
He was raised by both parents, Irene and John, and he had a brother also named John. From an early age, Stephen was easily spotted as a very intellectual kid. He was given a scholarship to Deerfield Academy, which was a pretty prestigious school in the area that he lived in. He was involved in extracurricular activities including skiing, mountain climbing, and cross country. He was accepted into Hope College in Holland, Michigan, where he studied history and German language. One of Stephen's professors described Stephen as much brighter and intense compared to other students. However, his peers did label him as weird because he was interested in Dungeons and Dragons. Between 1974 and 1977, Stephen left to go to Germany to study abroad and teach English at a university in Germany. While in Europe, he would ski, climb mountains, or involve himself in all things outdoors. In 1977, Stephen returned to Hope College and was set to graduate the following February in 1978. This was one of the coldest winters to date and Holland had just had a massive blizzard. Stephen wanted to go cross-country skiing, something that he regularly did. His roommates knew that he skied often and did not think much of this. Stephen made the six-mile trip from Holland to Lake Michigan. There was a lot of snow and the lake was frozen, which made perfect weather for his ski trip. Two days later, on February 20th, 1978, a group of people riding around on snowmobiles came across something a bit unusual. It was a pair of skis with a backpack propped on top of them, with both poles on either side. After they got closer, there were a set of footprints that led them from the backpack to the frozen lake but no tracks to show whoever this was had come back. There were tracks on the ice approximately 300 yards away from the snowy land, but again, no tracks showed that this person returned. They decided to call the local police to report a possible accident. However, it wouldn't take long to tie the two stories together, as Stephen's roommate had reported him missing the day before. Police did a thorough search of the area and found no returning tracks either. In a later report, they said that the ice was broken and piled up, so it was possible that Stephen had fallen through the ice and possibly drowned. Stephen's parents were called to be informed of their missing son, and they did not hesitate to book their plane tickets to find their missing son in Michigan. Stephen's father said that there was no way that Stephen was dead, as he was too good of an outdoorsman to not know what to do in a situation like this. Stephen's brother stated that Stephen would never leave his backpack behind because he kept their, his essentials in there, including a compass. By February 22, 1978, after long two days of searching for miles in every direction, police called off the search for Stephen. The search picked back up after the ice had melted on the lake, but again, no luck and no body. State police sent Stephen's dental records to surrounding cities in hopes that maybe he would turn up somewhere nearby and they could identify him through his dental records. Specifically, the dental records were sent to Chicago to see if he was possibly one of the bodies found at John Wayne Gacy's house. Thankfully, he was not, but he was still missing and his family still did not have answers. In June 1978, Hope College awarded Stephen with an honorary bachelor's degree, which was accepted by his parents. Stephen's parents were not giving up and even suspected that Stephen possibly had been murdered. They hired a man named Theo Grievers as their private investigator in hopes that maybe he could help them find their missing son. None of Stephen's story made any sense and they just wanted answers. Eventually, the couple gave up. May 5th, 1979, over a year after Stephen's disappearance, a man wakes up in a random field in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. He looks around, but doesn't recognize where he is or even the clothes that he's wearing. There is a backpack nearby that is full of maps, new clothes, eyeglasses, and different equipment. He grabs the backpack and makes his way into a town which happens to be Pittsfield, Massachusetts. He thinks to himself, where am I? How did I get here? He asks a random stranger where he is and eventually buys a newspaper and sees that the date says May 5th, 1979. He's puzzled at first, but his memory is starting to not be as cloudy. He remembers being in a dark, frozen lake and being afraid. 
He remembered that it was Lake Michigan and being there over a year ago, and it was right after a blizzard. He remembered his name was Stephen Kubaki, but he could not remember where he was for the last 14 months that had passed. He didn't know what to do. People probably thought that he had been dead by now due to how much time had passed. He didn't want to tell his parents right away, though. Stephen's aunt lived in Great Barrington, only 20 miles away of where he was, and he decided to make the trip to see her and get some answers. He hitchhiked a ride from a man and began the commute to his aunt's house. He knocked on the door, but there was no answer. Aunt June was at the house directly next to hers, sitting on the porch, watching, who was unbelievably at her doorstep. June immediately calls his parents and hands the phone to Stephen. He explains that he is alive, but he does not know where he has been for the past year. The reunion was bittersweet. Stephen's parents flew to Michigan to his aunt's house to reunite with their missing son, whom they thought was deceased. However, nothing was adding up or making any sense. Where was Stephen for the past 14 months? Why doesn't he remember anything? How was he 700 miles away from Lake Michigan? They didn't pressure him with questions as they were just happy he was back, alive, and safe. But the question still remained, where did he go and why did he not have any recollection of where he had been? Many psychologists and psychiatrists had different theories as to why Stephen could not remember the past year. One said that it was amnesia, Another said he suffered memory loss due to extreme emotional stress or depression and he was trying to flee from it. But Stephen denies any emotional stress and even states, quote, I don't feel there was anything, but that doesn't mean anything and that's the problem. I may have been under emotional stress, but I can't remember it. It may be a part of the repression. Stephen further explains that there was nothing in his personal life that could have caused emotional stress as his life was actually great leading up to his disappearance. At this time, the media was going absolutely bonkers. Every news outlet and reporter wanted to interview Stephen. He could not go anywhere without being recognized and it was getting a bit overwhelming. Stephen took his father's car to re-disappear just to get away from all of the reporters. Once he spoke to reporters, this is what he said. I was lying on the grass in a meadow when I woke up Saturday morning. I didn't know where I was. I was wearing clothes that weren't mine. I started going through a pack that I assumed was mine and I found maps. I would guess I was hitchhiking. I didn't know what the date was until I walked into a town and got a newspaper. He further stated that he wanted to know where he was and what he did and that his parents never believed that he was dead. He even stated that his first theory was possibly because of mountain climbing, which People usually suffer from a loss of body heat and exhaustion, which causes temporary loss of memory. The next day, Stephen returned to speak to reporters as his mind had changed. He wanted to get to the bottom of what happened, and maybe he could see a psychiatrist or undergo hypnosis to jar his memory. Stephen also explained that the feeling he had was like it was the Twilight Zone or some sort of science fiction where all of a sudden people are misplaced in a strange land. He recalled that he remembered walking on the ice and admiring the cool shapes they made when they froze and it was the furthest he had gone on the ice. The next memory that he had was waking up in the meadow in Pittsfield. In June 1979, Stephen was in another interview with the Boston Globe and stated that he had no interest in understanding the year that he lost out on his life. This was weird seeing as he had just been really determined to find out the truth only one month prior, but now he completely lost all interest. He just wanted to further his life, go back to school, and write poetry books. But everyone had the same question of what changed in one month to not wanting to know what happened to you for one year. According to The Missing Enigma here on YouTube, he reveals that he reached out to police officers, including the Michigan State Police, to view the police reports and was denied several times. Eventually, they were released. On February 20th, 1978, the day that Stephen went missing, a group of six snowmobilers called in to make a report after saying they came upon a suspicious situation. They were snowmobiling on Lake Michigan shore and they found a pair of skis on the beach with ski poles 
a backpack, and a set of tracks to Lake Michigan. When a state trooper arrived on the scene, they told the officer that they followed the tracks approximately 300 yards out onto the ice, but the ice started to get very thin. They stopped because they were afraid that they might fall in. Also, on the lake was ice that was about 30 to 40 feet high and covered in snow. The area where the backpack and skis were found was completely isolated and also had a fresh snowfall on top of them. The snowmobilers checked the backpack that was in between the skis and they had the initials SRK along with a dentist bill with Steven's name on it from February 3rd. Also included were a black insulated glove, lunch, cigar box, notebook, and more. Troopers looked for Steven, but no one had seen him. When troopers questioned his roommate, he said that Steven loved being on the ice and was adventurous, so this was not an uncommon thing. Police also received information from a young couple who were also on the ice that day that Steven went missing. They said a boy was climbing on the ice, but he did not match the description of Steven. Also, this boy was with another girl and people had told police that Steven was not dating anyone and was rarely seen with women. Okay, shit. Coffee break because I, I can't talk today apparently. Ooh, coffee is more. I forgot. I'm sorry. An article in Massachusetts. Hey, that word's so hard. Why do we have hard state names? An article in Massachusetts quotes Robert, who is one of Stephen's friends and classmates in college. Robert noted that a week before Stephen disappeared, Stephen had made a videotape explaining that he was going to leave the country because he hated the United States. He noted that Stephen would be traveling to Europe and that is likely where he had been the past year. Allegedly, this videotape that Stephen recorded was played throughout Michigan shortly after he was reported missing. Stephen denied that this was what the videotape was about and it was actually him telling stories about a previous trip he made to Germany. Also, a student at Berkshire Christian College named Ronald Curtis came forward after Stephen's story broke. Ronald stated that he saw Stephen hitchhiking and gave him a ride and Stephen never mentioned not knowing who he was or having amnesia of any sort. Ronald stated that he drove Stephen for roughly 40 minutes but Stephen had told him that his name was Nathan and he had just returned from San Francisco. He had taken a bus that was roughly $8 from Boston to Pittsfield before hitchhiking and eventually being in the car with Ronald. Upon further investigation, it was confirmed that a bus ticket from Boston to Pittsfield was $7.75. Now, this may not mean anything, but Stephen is not from this area and would have no way of knowing this. In the end, Ronald stated that it may have been amnesia and he genuinely was confused but he was not inclined to believe what he said. These are some of the theories surrounding what happened to Stephen in the 14 months that he was missing. The first theory is that Stephen had a fugue state or disassociative amnesia. A fugue state is a rare psychiatric disorder in which a person temporarily loses their sense of identity and may travel or wander without any memory of their actions. After the fugue state ends, the individual usually has no recollection of the period during which they were in the altered state of consciousness. This theory suggests that Stephen Kubaki, possibly overwhelmed by stress or personal issues, entered a fugue state and wandered away from his life. During this time, he may have adopted a new identity, only to later wake up from the fugue with no memory of the intervening months. While this explanation is plausible, it does not account for the strange details surrounding his reappearance, such as the change of clothes and the distance that he traveled. Another theory poses that Stephen was abducted by a cult or a secretive organization that experimented on him or brainwashed him during his disappearance. This theory is fueled by the fact that Stephen had no memory of his time while he was away and also the strange items found in his possession when he had reappeared. Also, if what Ronald Curtis stated was true and that he had picked up Stephen, he reported that Stephen went to San Francisco to become involved in an Eastern religious cult. Some conspiracy theorists suggest that Stephen may have been the subject of a mind control experiment or other psychological manipulations by a shadowy group, perhaps as a part of a government or military program. The idea such as clandestine operations is not without precedent. Historical examples include the CIA's MKUltra project, 
which involved experiments on unwitting subjects to explore mind control techniques. However, there is no concrete evidence to support the claim that Kubaki was involved in such activities. The third theory is the paranormal or supernatural involvement. Given the location of Stevens' disappearance was in the so-called Lake Michigan Triangle, some theorists have proposed that his case involves paranormal or supernatural elements. The Lake Michigan Triangle has been linked to numerous mysterious events, including disappearances, unexplained lights, and even UFO sightings. Many people have also disappeared in this Michigan Triangle and can be compared to the well-known Bermuda Triangle. One paranormal theory is that Kubaki may have been abducted by extraterrestrials and subjected to experiments, which could explain his missing time and lack of memory. Others believe that he may have entered a interdimensional portal or some other supernatural phenomenon that caused him to disappear and reappear in a different location, with his memory wiped out as a result. While these theories are certainly intriguing, they rely heavily on speculative and anecdotal evidence, which makes them way more difficult to prove or disprove. Another popular theory among many conspiracy enthusiasts is that Kubaki may have experienced a time slip or dimensional shift. This theory suggests that Stephen accidentally traveled through time or crossed into an alternate dimension during his skiing trip. His 15-month absence could then be explained by the time it took him to return to his original timeline or dimension. This theory also suggests that concepts from quantum physics and science fiction, where the idea of parallel universes and time travel have been explored extensively. However, like the paranormal theories discussed earlier, this explanation is highly speculative and lacks scientific evidence to support it as well. And the last conspiracy, which is probably the most well-explained conspiracy, is that he intentionally disappeared. A more skeptical perspective is that Stephen may have staged his own disappearance for reasons that we don't know. This theory suggests that he may have wanted to just escape his life, possibly due to per personal or financial problems, and he deliberately vanished, only to return later whenever he was ready. His claim of amnesia could have been a way to avoid explaining his actions during the time that he was missing. Also, Robert stated that the videotapes that Stephen made said he was leaving to go to Europe. While this theory is very possible, those who knew Stephen described him as a very stable and intelligent person with no apparent motive to fake his own disappearance. The fact that he was found with items that he did not recognize and traveled such a long distance makes this theory less likely according to a lot of people. Stephen, what is he up to today? He's still alive. He's lived a very regular life. He became a clinical psychologist and worked at numerous universities since his reappearance. He is currently writing a book about his strange story and hopes to find out what happened to him back in 1978. He also has a website dedicated to his story as well, and you can request an interview, which I did twice. Haven't heard anything back, so that's fine. I think I reached out to him like two months ago and then another time last month. If somehow he reaches out to me and agrees, then we'll do something later on. We'll do like a special episode. What do y'all think? What is, I mean, if y'all have a theory that I did not explain, tell me. Tell me your theory. Explain to me what you believe that this theory could be. If you even have one or if you agree with some of the theories that were said. Of course, I would love to say that something paranormal or extraterrestrial happened to him. I would love to say that he was abducted by aliens. I'm going to say the one that I think is probably the best explained of this story is probably the fugue state or dissociative am amnesia. I think that that's very much highly possible. Based off of many people talking about Stephen, that is something, disappearing is just something he wouldn't do. He was close with his family. He was on the path to graduate. They're, they just could not, they did not think that, that was happening. So, which people have been proven wrong before, you know, but this was a different time. So, I definitely think that maybe being out in the ice, he might have fell, but he pulled himself out and was in a fugue state. You know, he possibly did get it. Let me look up, actually, can you get amnesia from being really cold? So, hypothermia does cause memory loss and confusion. So, maybe it is possible that he just genuinely, like, might have been really cold. Now, again, that does not explain how far he was found and also it being a whole year. 
I don't know how long it would happen. I just, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't, I don't know. I think the least likely theory would probably be a cult or secret organization that was doing experiments on them. I don't necessarily think that that happened. You know, there's no evidence to support that he joined a cult in San Francisco. And also, not saying that um, Ronald was a liar. I'm not calling him a truther. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, that might have been a guy named Nathan. It might not have even been Stephen. He might have just been doing this for fame. I don't know. I think that's the least likely. Only because I believe in aliens. <laughs> it's highly possible that he was he was abducted by aliens. Do y'all believe in aliens? We're too big. Like, Milky Way is, all, is like literally so ginormous and we are so small compared to the rest of other galaxies. And you're, t you're telling me human beings, me sipping a coffee and talking about this in a podcast, we're the only, only life ever out of all galaxies, the entire universe? No. No one can convince me otherwise. I know that there's, <laughs> there's not concrete evidence that aliens are real, but I also don't trust the government. We're probably doomed. Aliens are probably like helping the government out right now, like to wipe us all out. Wow, that just like sent me into a spiral. Like now I have tears in my eyes. Hey. <laughs> oh my god. I just I just had like a vision and it literally just like made me really sad. Okay, that's not how I wanted to end this podcast, but it's fine. Again, let me just do my final wrap up. Final wrap up. Okay, so we have Sip and Solve. Make sure to tell me about the Sauter family. Do your research and tell me y'all's thoughts, theories, opinions about what happened to the five missing children. Second thing, again, I still do have a affiliate or two affiliate codes, one with NordVPN and one with Movavi. But if y'all want to secure your Wi-Fi and protect your browsing while you're on wi-fi click the link down below i do get a commission from this if you go directly through this link also mavavi is more for video editing i understand most people don't that's just an affiliate code that i have and click directly through the link so that way they know that you came from this channel third thing tell me your thoughts theories and opinions about the story today about steven kubaki and what happened steven looks like he's a nice man i really hope that he reaches out to me and wants to do an interview he's only done two on different podcasts and i think it's been within the past year or two so hopefully i'm the third <laughs> third time's a charm i think that's going to be it for today thank you guys so much for listening i hope that you enjoyed today's story as it's not as intense next week is going to be pretty it's going to be pretty hard to listen to i got to be real so just be prepared for that thank you guys so much for listening and i hope to see you guys in the next episode bye